Good afternoon and welcome back to Stories with Don, reading Robin Hood. And today we're on chapter four, and this is entitled The Kirtle Friar. Uh, so I think this is another chapter about getting another member for his band. So let us begin. One fine day, when the forest was at its greenest and loveliest, and the sun was casting a pattern of light and shade on the smooth greensward, Robin Hood's men were in so joyous a mood that they resolved to make a holiday. They ran races and jumped like so many merry schoolboys. They played with the quarterstaff, they wrestled, they danced, they practiced every sport of the forest. At last they came to the sport which was nearest and dearest to their hearts, the use of the good longbow. They might try their hands at this or that, but in the end they were certain to betake themselves with new delight to their beloved archery. Several parties went into the forest in search of deer, and one party was formed of Robin Hood, Little John, Much the Miller's Son, and Will Scarlet. Soon they saw a herd pasturing at a good distance, and Robin Hood said, Which of you can kill a buck or doe five hundred feet away? Instantly, Will Scarlet killed a buck, and Much killed a bow. But Little John drew his great bow and loosed a mighty shaft and sent it humming through the heart of a big stag more than 500 feet away. Good shot, cried Robin Hood. God's blessing on thy heart, Little John. I would go a hundred miles to find the man who would match you with the bow. Will Scarlet began to laugh upon hearing this flattering speech. You need not go a hundred miles, Robin, he cried. You can meet his match nearer than that. I know not where to go, replied Robin Hood. Why, to Fountain's Abbey, cried Will Scarlet. There you may find a kirtle friar. Oh, and kirtle, it says here, means short frock. A kirtle friar who can draw a strong bow with either arm. He will beat little John, aye, or you either. Robin Hood pricked up his ears when he heard this. His master pot passion was to draw a stout fellow to him, awoke at once, and he vowed that he would seek out this famous friar without delay. So he made himself ready for the journey, and away he went. Robin was well armed, for the country into which he meant to venture was a dangerous for him, a dangerous one for him, if he should become known. He wore a coat and a cap of steel, a good sword at his side, a buckler on his arm, a sheaf of arrows slung at his belt, and his trusty longbow at his shoulder. At last he rode into the beautiful dale where Fountain's Abbey stood, and where its ruins stand to this day, and he saw the river calmly gliding, a band of silver through a sweet valley. He drew rein to glance over the scene, and as he looked, he saw a figure walking at the waterside. It was a strange figure, for those wrapped in the robe of a curdle friar with a cord around the waist, a steel cap was on the friar's head, and a sword and buckler were at his side. By my faith, thought Robin, this should be my man, if he be a friar. He has the air of a fighting friar, and he must be the man I seek. Now I will make trial of him. So Robin sprang down from the saddle, tied his horse to a thorn, and went to meet the Kirtle friar. Robin followed a path which ran down straight to the river and then appeared on the other side. There is a ford there, thought Robin Hood, and I am in mind to cross it dry shod, and the friar shall take me over. Now where is he? For the burly form of the curdled friar had disappeared among the bushes that fringed the stream. Presently Robin saw him coming back. The friar was pacing to and fro on the river bank, reading from his missal. As he began to chant a psalm, and his voice was like as he came, he began to chant a psalm, and his voice was like the bellowing of a bull. Suddenly the friar's voice stopped in mid-verse. 
he had gained the point where the road ran into the river, and there stood a stranger whose bow was bent and whose shaft was pointed full at him. Such a sight as this would have dismayed many, but the curdled friar took it very calmly. His round, red, plump face lost not a shade of color. His little pig-like eyes, almost hidden in the fat of his cheeks, were filled more with amusement than alarm. And he thrust his steel cap back and scratched his bald, shiny noddle with one forefinger. I faith, he said, ye may put down that bow and arrow, my son. If your purpose be robbery, tis useless. Not the smallest coin have I about me, and twere trying to dine off a dry bone to rob a curdle friar, a man vowed to poverty. And if your purpose be not robbery, I know not why you should point a shaft at me, since never before have I set eyes on your face. Nay, friar, said Robin, I seek neither thy life nor their money. I do but wish to have thy aid in crossing this ford, for I see that the water runs deep after rain. Therefore take me on thy back and carry me over. The friar said nothing, only pulled a wry face in so comical a fashion that Robin had much ado not to burst into a fit of laughter. But the holy man carefully, carefully laid his missile down and prepared to take the outlaw on his broad, burly back. Robin Hood leaped merrily to his perch, and silently the friar strode into the water, and soon they reached the other side. When they were over the stream, Robin Hood sprang nimbly from the friar's back and turned to thank him. But as he was doing so, he felt himself seized in a grip of iron and saw a dagger at his throat. "'What means this, friar?' he cried. "'What, would, what, would you shed my blood? "'Know you not that a churchman is forbidden to shed blood? "'The blame will rest on thee, my son, if blood be shed,' replied the friar with a grim chuckle. "'Obey but my simple commands, and your skin is safe.' Refuse, and I will slit your windpipe three fingers deep. And what dost thou ask? cried Robin. I have left my missile on the farther side, said the curdle friar. Lend thy aid, I pray thee, to convey me over this rude stream that I may recover it. This was a bitter pill for Robin to swallow, to be obliged to carry the friar back, but there was no dodging out of it. The knife was at his throat, and the girtle friar had the strength of a bull as well as the voice of one. So Robin was compelled to bend his back and take up the enormous weight of the stout friar, who was almost as thick as he was long. It was a long time before Robin Hood forgot that trip across the ford with the curdle friar on his back. It seemed as if no mortal man could be such a frightful load as the friar proved. Robin was bent too double under it, and every bone in his body seemed to crack under the weight of the friar's burly form. Then Robin knew not the ford as the other did, and he floundered into holes and slid about on slippery stones, and time and again was within an ace of going down headlong into the stream. But the friar tugged his hair, jerking him up when he appeared about to fall and pounding him with both heels like one urging a reluctant steed across. At length, Robin, panted and, panting and gasping, came to the farther bank, and the friar leapt lightly down, for unwieldy as this churchman looked, he was as nimble as any. But as the curdle friar bounded to earth, Robin Hood caught him by the ankle and tripped him up, and the friar came to earth with such a bang that all his breath was driven out of him in an odd sound which was something between a squeal and a grunt. And here's a, uh, and then Robin Hood whipped out his sword and bestrode his fallen opinion, whose helmet had flown three yards away. Here's a picture of Robin carrying the friar across the stream. Now, friar, Robin cried, I think the game has turned my way again. I am still in mind to reach the farther shore. 
Promise me that you will once more carry me over or I will cleave your bald noodle in twain. I promise, gasped the curdle friar as soon as he could draw a breath, for he, li he liked not the look of the heavy shining blade flashing upon above his bald crown. So once again the friar took Robin upon his broad back and strode into the stream. But in the middle of the stream the friar paused for a moment. Robin thought the holy man had halted to gain fresh foothold, and he laughed to think the friar, to think the friar, and not he was floundering. Robin thought the holy man had halted to gain fresh foothold, and he laughed to think the friar, and not he was floundering over the slippery stones this time. But his laugh was cut short. The curdled friar suddenly gave a tremendous jerk of his huge shoulders and shot Robin Hood head first into the river. Now, roared the curdle friar, choose ye, my fine fellow, whether you will sink or swim. Saying this, he turned and bustled back to his own side of the stream. Robin Hood was washed to the other side by the strong current, and he caught hold of a bush of broom whose long branches swept the water. Now he dragged himself to the bank and scrambled ashore. He turned at once to see where his cunning opponent was. There stood the burly friar, laughing all over his fat, a fat red face, to see Robin Hood climb to land with the water pouring from every stitch of his clothes. I'll soon make thee laugh on the other side of thy mouth, Jack Priest, shouted Robin Hood, who was hopping mad after this great ducking. He caught up a, his bow and let fly let an arrow fly with tremendous force, but it never reached its mark, short as the distance was, and so true the aim, for the friar raised his steel buckler and caught the arrow very deftly in the middle of it. This he did time after time until Robin had emptied his quiver and never touched the fat friar once. Then the friar sang in his great roaring voice like a bullfrog in the pond, Shoot on, shoot on, thou fine fellow, shoot as thou hast begun. If thou shoot here a summer's day, thy shaft I will not shun. Nay, shouted Robin when his last arrow was sped, if I cannot reach ye with the great goose shaft, friar, <clears throat> I will show ye a trick or two with the broadsword. And with that, he drew his sword, swung his buckler up, and leapt into the river. Seeing that the outlaw meant to assail him at close quarters, the curdle friar ran for his steel cap and clapped it on his round bullet head and took sword and buckler himself. <clears throat> As he turned to the fray, Robin sprang to the bank and was upon him at the next moment. The, then began a fierce and obstinate battle. The great broadswords flashed and glittered as they were swung on high to deliver mighty strokes and the steel bucklers rang again as the heavy blades were caught and turned aside. Up and down the bank the combatants swung to and fro as they struck at each other, Robin leap, leaping nimbly from side to side to seek some unguarded point of his opponent's defenses, and the doughty friar turning and turning and meeting him face to face all the time. <clears throat> For a full hour swords struck and bucklers rang. They fought on the bank, in the water, waded ashore again, lunged, parried, smote, warded, lashed at each other with might and main. At last they were fain to pause and lean on their swords, so weary were they from this stern battle. Beshrew me, my friend, said Robin Hood. Thou art to the full as bold a companion as I expected to find. A boon, a boon I beg of thee. What boon dost thou ask? Added the said the friar. Nay, but this, replied the outlaw. Hold thy sword while I put this horn to my mouth and blow three blasts. Blow as thou pleasest, replied the friar. I care not for thy horn. Robin, horns, Robin Hood smiled, for he knew what his horn would bring. Then he set it to his mouth and blew three mighty calls. The third call was still echoing among the woods when fifty yeomen, their bows ready bent, came racing over the lee. What men are these, cried the friar, who come so hastily? 
These are my men, friar, replied Robin Hood, and they hastened to their master's aid. And who art thou? asked the friar. Men call me Robin Hood, quoth Robin, and these bold archers are my companions in the greenwood. What is thy name, bold friar? said Robin Hood. Thou art a man after my own heart. I am called Friar Tuck, said the curtal friar, and these seven years have I kept this veil and beaten every man who hath ventured into it against my will. Come with us to Mary Sherwood, cried Robin. We need a priest that we may not live like heathen in the greenwood. We are outlaws and dare not venture to church in town. But if you would join us, thou couldst sing us a mass and read us a service. And every Sunday throughout the year, a noble shall be thy fee. I will come, cried Friar Tuck. My heart leans towards your jolly brotherhood, and I will be your priest and father confessor. I will bring my dogs, and we will range the greenwood with them and hold many a fine stag at bay. That was how the famous Friar Tuck joined Robin's band in Sherwood and came to have his share in many a song and story. That ends that chapter. So now we have, what? Like, oh, what's he added? Three or four people to his band, all of whom he had to fight to have that happen. So now we'll start seeing what happens with this band, I think. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope you have a good rest of the afternoon. May you stay well and may God bless you. Goodbye.